Well, thanks to Dave and the organizing committee for the invitation to be back here. It's always fun to come back, especially on a beautiful sunny day like today, back to campus and see all the new buildings and such, and see all the familiar faces. It's, it's really nice to, to come home and see everybody again. Um, I will not have all the answers. I wish I did, but um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, reviewing what we think we know about bedding management um, and talk a little bit about some preliminary results from a study we're working on in Minnesota. I hope to have the final results sometime in the next decade. We'll see how that goes. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to take a minute and acknowledge my co-authors. Uh, Krithika Patel is the PhD student working with me on this project. Aaron Royster and Jenny Timmerman and Brian Crooker at the University of Minnesota and Larry Fox is at Washington State University. Before we get going, I thought I'd take a little foray into a little detour into politics. Um, usually the news isn't quite so happy. This, this week there was a happy little bit of news that came out. Um, congratulations, <laughs> Canada. So you've got, what have you got? Supply management, universal health care, and now this, right? <laughs> So, well done, well done. <laughs> there are more than a few jealous American dairy producers south of the border. All right, to begin, um, I'm going to go into bedding management and its relationship with utter health. Um, I thought before we get going there, though, um, we'll just review, and I know that all of you already know this, so how, how do producers choose their bedding choices anyway? Um, there are a variety of different bits of logic that lead to a decision. And there's usually a reason, once we ask some questions and understand the situation, there's usually a reason things are done the way they're done. Um, ideally, we would think, um, as veterinarians anyway, uh, that, that people would choose their bedding based on concern about the health, the welfare of the animal. So we know bedding affects comfort and cushion, traction and footing, lameness, um, absorbency, and cow cleanliness, which ties in with utter health, will get there eventually. Um, and of course, we'd all imagine that sand is king, and sand is king when you look at this list. But people don't always choose sand, so why is that? And that's because of this other list on the board here. Sometimes people make choices, decisions for other reasons, like the availability in their area, the cost, ease of handling, or constraints within the manure system. And, and so we need to understand that. So yeah, I love it if everybody uses new sand, but they don't. And we all have to work with clients who have other types of bedding materials, maybe not ideal, but we have to work within those constraints and get the best performance we can out of them. So that's where we're headed. So we're talking about environmental mastitis control here for the most part, not contagious mastitis, and that's when the little environmental mastitis pathogen gets on the teeth skin, up the street canal, and obviously sets up an infection. So we've got a lot of different opportunities, strategies to prevent environmental mastitis, um, focusing on cow resistance or resilience to infection. So that includes things like vaccination programs, proper nutrition, uh, avoiding stressors, um, maybe genetics, if you believe in the, the big E, little G, whatever, Carrie Lismore taught us, yeah. Um, so there's that. There's the importance of the pre-milking under preparation and everything that goes into the parlor that's really important. And, but the cow spends most of her day not in the parlor but out in the barn, and so that's where we need to do what we can to reduce exposure to environmental mastitis pathogens out there. So there are a number of different things we can do out there to prevent manure buildup in standing water and alleyways that cows are going to get on their feet and legs, track up into stalls, lay on it, and so forth. Barn design, like two rows versus three row barns, obviously three row pens are more crowded, produce more manure, more opportunity to track that into stalls. Stocking density, same thing, more manure. Ventilation, you know, bugs need nutrients, warmth, um, and moisture. So if we can do things to mitigate humidity in barns, that should be a benefit. And then finally, bedding selection and management, which is what I'm going to focus on today. There may be other things too. Um, so I want to introduce you to my next door neighbors, Jenny and Bill. Um, they grew up in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Apart from enjoying cheese and wine, they know nothing about dairy cattle or management, etc. And so this May, I think it was May before the snow melted finally in Minnesota, um, I hosted a barbecue for a few people. And this is the conversation Jenny and I were having on the deck. So Jenny asked me, hey, Sandra, so what are you working on at the school? And I said, Jenny, you know, I'm really excited. I'm studying bedding management and how to prevent mastitis in dairy cattle. And Jenny said, huh, so what does that involve? Keeping it clean and dry? 
Right. Right. So, Ron, Ron you, you call this my Jenny moment this morning over breakfast. Yes, this is my Jenny moment. So, you know, what was my response? You know, I'm stuttering through, um, or yeah, maybe. But if it's really that simple, why am I doing this research? If it's really that simple, why are we here today to talk about it? So, you know, I took a swig of beer and then tried to console myself. No, 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 it's really more than that. Um, you know, yes, it, <laughs> it should be clean, but, you know, how clean should it be? We don't know. And how dry should it be? We need to learn that. And how do we monitor it? And what management strategies aren't we clued into that could help? Um, so I tried to reassure myself that, no, there really is something more to be learned about this, this area of focus um, on the way to improving utter health. So. So that's leading us to uh, my outline. So what I'd like to do today is review a little bit of the literature uh, to date on what we think we know about bedding management, um, relationships between bedding bacteria counts, this BBC thing you're going to see, and utter health, um, management strategies to reduce bedding bacteria counts, assuming they are a risk factor, and then monitoring. So what do we know about that? And then that'll lead into some of the preliminary findings from the study that we're doing at Minnesota. So the first question was, what is the relationship between bedding bacteria counts and utter health? And um, intuitively, we're all thinking, oh, well, it goes something like this. We've got bacteria in the bedding that gets on the teeth skin, sneaks up into the street canal, and we've got an increased risk of intramammary infection in the cow. Now, if we go looking for literature to support that, that have investigated those associations, uh, this is a number of studies. This is not an exhaustive list, but a number of studies have handily demonstrated that, yes, higher bacteria counts in bedding do equate to higher bacteria counts in teeth skin. However, when we go looking for things to draw an association here to here, teeth skin to intramammary infection, it, there's surprisingly little out there. Um, this is actually an immersion, broth immersion study, so artificial challenge, not even natural exposure, but that was demonstrated. Now, if we look for studies that look for this as a direct association, bacteria counts and bedding versus intramammary infection risk, uh, there's a bit more research out there. So here are a number of studies that found a positive relationship, positive meaning as bacteria counts and bedding went up, so did the risk for intramammary infection, whether that was measured as clinical or subclinical infection. So that fits with what we believe should be true. But there are a couple of studies worth noting that found no relationship. Um, a lot of these studies, not all of them, but a lot of them do have some limitations, though. They were done decades ago, sometimes on a single farm, sometimes with small numbers of cows, sometimes with older bedding materials, not necessarily what we're using today. Um, some of these studies are, were of limited duration, so we can pick holes in a few of them, not all of them, but they were, um, in general, this is what we're seeing. Now, if we back up a little bit in this little diagram, the next question might be, what about the bedding type? And how does the bedding type, whether it's organic or inorganic, and then there are different types of organic beddings, um, how does that fit with associations to bacteria counts in bedding, dot, 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 or direct associations with infection risk? So there are a number of different studies reported. Some of them are clinical trials. More often than not, they're observational studies, but I'll just give you a, a taste of what's been done. So new sand, never been used sand. It's inorganic, obviously. It, it should be dry, should have a very low orga organic matter, grows relatively little bugs. And from what's been done um, and published, we t tend to see that this, this produces the best utter health. Reclaimed sand, or recycled sand, um, yes, it's inorganic, but we all know that there's added moisture and there is residual organic matter left in, and this will grow bugs, more so than you would think. Um, we have equivocal results in the literature saying that reclaimed sand bedding results in better utter health or not. Um, does it equal new sand or not? Results are mixed, relatively little published. Sawdust, a uh, little bit published on sawdust. Uh, sawdust gets the the uh, reputation for supporting coliforms and Klebsiella, you've probably heard that before, although that's not all. Shavings has the reputation of supporting strep species. And then there's our friend manure solids. So, is manure solids a thing in, in, in Ontario yet much? It's a big thing in the Midwest. Um, so manure solids could be green or raw. 
they could be composted, they could be digested, there's different ways of processing them. We have relatively limited studies published on them, but those studies fairly consistently report that we get the worst utter health in those herds and, and experience, um, you can ask Roger or Ron or whomever, people who live and work with herds in the Midwest, um, it's not uncommon that a herd puts in manure solids as their bedding type and their somatic cell count goes up. So that uh, little bit of research does fit with the clinical experience. So that's just a quick review of what we think we know about different bedding types and the relationship with bacteria counts and other health. So putting the whole picture all together, um, yes, all of this fits most of the time, but there are limitations to a lot of these studies. Um, bedding choice can be an important determinant of bacteria counts and subsequently utter health. However, that can't be the whole picture. Because if I ask Roger or Ron or somebody else that's working with Midwest herds, uh, yeah, we might say that on average manure solids do worse utter health wise, but we all know individual herds using manure solids who do a wonderful job have really good utter health. So they're doing something differently and it's up to us to discover that something and communicate it to the rest of the world because they're not all gonna adopt sand like we, we might wish. Okay, uh, another question that comes up is what are the desirable bedding characteristics um, that might uh, reduce bedding bacteria counts? And a couple of characteristics we might think about. One is organic matter as relates to sand. In a Vet Clinics of North America publication, Hogan and Smith, who have a full, full career studying mastitis and, and in particular bedding, they've suggested that the organic matter level in sand be less than 5%. There's nothing published anywhere that says, that shows us quantitatively the risk goes up above or below that cut point. This is their uh, combined experience over a lifetime. Um, dry matter, what should the dry matter be? Uh, again, Hogan and Smith have suggested for sand it be greater than 95%, manure solids greater than 35%. Where did those numbers come from? Well, it came from their collective experience and they just after looking at enough herds and testing enough samples, decided, ah, oh, 35 sounds good. Um, I'm not taking away at all. I'm not suggesting these are wrong. They may be right on the ball, but we don't have a lot of studies um, to quantify that, to, to say, yes, we've got good evidence to support picking those cut points or those goals. So I, I would argue we need more information on these types of questions. Another bedding characteristic we might investigate is pH. Um, and a lot of you may be aware uh, that we can buy and sprinkle bedding conditioners or even just barn lime onto the bedding to manipulate the pH, either make it more alkaline or more acidic. And if we get that alkaline enough or acidic enough, that will suppress bacterial growth. There's a fair bit actually published on this. Most of them clinical trials conducted in herds, small numbers of stalls. Um, typically, but this is an example. This is done by Hogan in 1999, where this is in a manure solids bedding. They had four treatment groups. There's a negative control, a barn lime or hydrated lime, alkaline conditioner, and an acidic conditioner. And so what we've got here, this is the total gram negative bacteria count in the bedding. This is the strep bacteria count in the bedding. And on day zero, you can see there's the negative control. There's the three treatment groups. On day zero, the day the bedding is put in the stall, yeah, it works. Bedding counts are lower. However, by day one, everybody's up, everybody's the same. And a number of studies have investigated different conditioners and the results are really consistent across the board. So conditioners do reduce bacteria counts in bedding for roughly a day, that's all you've got. So if you're gonna use these products, you're gonna to need to apply them, reapply them daily. Um, also, what we don't know is the impact of that on utter health. Typically, these studies look at the impact on the bacteria counts in the bedding, but they don't take it to the logical conclusion, which is to say, oh, and utter health was better or worse. So studies are lacking to investigate that question. Um, that leads us to other questions. What are the bedding management strategies that we have that we could implement on farms to change bedding characteristics or to otherwise improve um, the situation, reduce bedding bacteria counts. There are a number of things that we do. Some of them have data, a lot of them don't. Um, one that does have some data is the, the frequency with which we put new bedding into stalls. So if you're using organic bedding materials, in this picture it's shavings, manure solids would be the same thing. Um, 
we can see that if we put, the more frequently we put the bedding into the stall, the lower the bacteria counts will be, and ideally would be every single day. And, and there's just a couple of studies, others have shown the same thing. So that one we know about. However, there are a number of other things that intuitively make sense to us, and Hogan and Smith have recommended them in their review, but we don't have a lot of uh, data to support. We've got our clinical experience, and the combined clinical experience in this room is huge, and so I trust that, but it would be really nice to generate some more data behind these. So, you know, anybody who's listened to Gordy Jones talk about the stall dimensions and whether the cow is properly, squarely, you know, indexed in the stall, not... Uh, too far up, not sideways, defecating in the stall. That should keep the stall cleaner. Um, removing, you know, manure pats or soiled bedding from the back of the stall two, three times a day whenever the cows are out. Uh, preventing standing water and manure in alleyways or on pathways headed to the parlor is going to minimize feet and leg contamination, therefore hopefully reduce what she carries up into the stall. Avoiding overcrowding, same thing. Two row versus three row pen, same thing. Ventilation, I mentioned these before. They all make sense. Uh, we just don't have a lot of data behind them. But we do them because they make sense. All right. Are there other approaches to reducing bedding bacteria counts? Here's a fun one. This is the dragon invented by Joe Hogan. Um, this is a single herd, a uh, herd dairyman that trusted Joe very much, I guess. Uh, they used recycled sand, and, and they put the recycled sand in on day zero, and then daily for six days, they came along with this implement and torched the surface of the bedding, and uh, daily for six days. And they sampled daily to culture bedding counts, and they did report a redu reduction in the gram-negative bacteria counts on the top 25 millimeters of the surface of the bedding, which was roughly a 0.3 log reduction. Um, and it only worked on day zero to day one. It didn't work for the remaining days out to day six. So that's cool, interesting. Um, they weren't able to measure the impact on other health. That was not an objective. So we don't know if a 0.3 log reduction matters in terms of mastitis risk. Also, barn safety comes into question. And I don't think Joe would ever recommend anybody actually go do this. But it was kind of fun. Um, now here's one that might have a little more potential, and we're seeing some more interest in this, especially in the Midwest where I mentioned a lot of our producers are looking at manure solids, but some of them are struggling. Um, this is the McClanahan Triple Pass Drum Dryer. Some of you are familiar with the McClanahan, you know, the sand separators and such. The idea here is that on this farm, this is a one farm in central Wisconsin, uh, they've already pressed and, and separated the solids. In this case, it's green solids, but it could be composted. And the solids, when they come out of the, the screw press, are roughly 30% dry matter, according to this dairyman. He'll put them in the drum dryer now, and then they come out at about 40% dry matter. It cost him half a million dollars, US dollars, to install. In the one and a half years since he installed it, he reports that his somatic cell count has dropped from 200 to 100,000. He reports reduced clinical mastitis. I haven't looked at his records. Um, but this is a testimonial. There is no control group, and nobody's measured the cost benefit or the payback. But um, you guys, I'm sure, have seen uh, some of some herds have adopted this, and there's more interest in it. So we need to learn more about it because this is a pricey little fix. Um, is it worth it? Okay. Assuming all of that, assuming bedding bacteria counts are associated with other health, the next question I wanted to address is should, how do we monitor it? Can we monitor it? What should we be looking for? So this is the um, University of Minnesota Utter Health Laboratory Bedding Culture Report, and other commercial labs and state labs in the U.S. will do bedding cultures for you. Um, so what we have here is the bedding name, uh, and then we report bacillus, coliforms, environmental strep, staph, uh, non-coliform gram negatives and total bacteria count. So that's cool, you can send your bedding samples in and we'll culture it for you. Report goes back and then typically what happens is the very next day we get a phone call from either the producer or the vet, either Aaron Royster or myself, and this is the question. What does this mean? Is this good? Is this bad? What should my numbers be? And if Aaron and I are being perfectly honest, which we try to be, we say, well, we really don't know what your numbers should be. Really big numbers are probably bad, really low numbers are probably good, but we really don't have a lot of evidence to guide what, how to interpret this report. 
And I personally have a little bit of an ethical dilemma selling a service when I don't know how to interpret the results. And frankly, that was the impetus for doing the study that I'm going to tell you about later. So like, if we're going to keep doing this, we have to figure out how to interpret these. All right, so how should we interpret bedding bacteria counts? What should the number be? Well, this number gets kicked around in the, in the mastitis world anyway, this number of 1 million. Your count should be less than 1 million. Well, 1 million what? I think we heard that before lunch. What's the unit? Um, if you start to go digging in the literature, this is what you find. It's precious little. But uh, it's 1 million coliforms. And the first reference to it was in 1975, Bramley and Neve. They reported on a randomized clinical trial. They had some other groups going, but in one group, there were 24 cows on SADA, seven of which suffered a clinical coliform infection, six of which were caused by Klebsiella. So maybe that's where SADA got its Klebsiella um, reputation. And they observed in the discussion, they observed that the mean coliform counts in sawdust were nearly 10 to the seventh. CFUs per gram of wet bedding. So nearly 10 to the seventh, I guess that means higher than 10 to the sixth. Maybe that's where the 10 to the 6 number came from. I don't know. Uh, 1978, Carolyn Jasper reported an observational study, three California dairies on manure solids, where they presented no actual data to this effect. But in their discussion, they stated that they saw increased clinical Klebsiella cases if the Klebsiella counts in the bedding exceeded 10 to the 6. OK, maybe that's where the number came from. And finally, 1985, Bramley was giving a presentation at the annual NMC meeting, evidently. He, um, in the proceedings, he reports on a randomized clinical trial where they observed more coliform mastitis cases on sawdust, so you get sawdust again, um, than on sand. So that was data, that's good. Um, and then in the, uh, it's not in the paper, it's not in the proceedings paper. Apparently, though, during the presentation, he said, uh, in front of the audience, I think we see increased E. coli mastitis if sawdust coliforms exceed 10 to the 6 CFUs per gram. This is the only reference to this cut point that I can find anywhere in the literature. So I think we have a ways to go. You know, we got some sawdust, we got coliforms, we don't have much else. Um, it's pinned on very little, little data. So I think, I think we have a ways to go in, in figuring out how to interpret bedding culture reports, if indeed they're going to be a useful monitoring tool at all. Okay, so just to summarize that little quick review, what do we know, what do we not know? Many, but not all, studies suggest that there is a relationship between bedding bacteria counts and other health, although, although this is not always well defined, especially not for newer bedding materials. In terms of monitoring, I'm going to argue that we don't know how to monitor bedding bacteria counts. I don't think we have a lot of solid evidence. We've got clinical experience, but not a lot of evidence to say what the bedding characteristics should be, dry matter, organic matter. And then I'd, I'd suggest that we are aware of some management strategies to reduce bedding bacteria counts, but we need to learn a whole lot more about others. So I think that's where we're sitting at today. So that leads us to the objectives of the Minnesota study. Uh, objective number one is to describe the relationship between bedding bacteria counts and other health. Is there a relationship? Number two was, assuming there, we do find a relationship, see if we can comfortably develop goals or benchmarks uh, to interpret bedding culture reports. And then finally, see if we can tease out best management practices or things that herds are doing that are associated with uh, lower bacteria counts in bedding and improved other health. Things like, questions like, what is the bedding type? What are the bedding characteristics? What other bedding management strategies have they adopted that seem to be associated with um, lower bedding bacteria counts. So those are our objectives. And I'm not going to answer all these questions today. We haven't got all the analysis done, but this is what I'm going to focus on today, these two questions, excuse me, right here. Okay, so on to the methods. Um, this is a prospective cross-sectional observational study. Uh, the herds were enrolled from 17 different states around the United States by either the herd veterinarian or if there was a local university with a researcher or extension agent who was interested um, in helping us out, they helped us enroll herds. Um, Ron Erskine, Michigan State, enrolled a bunch of herds for us, and I'm very grateful to everybody who helped us out. 
The herds had to be using one of four bedding types, either new sand, recycled sand, manure solids, or other organic materials. Other organic primarily ended up being shavings or straw, although we did get it, the odd you know, oat holes or almond holes, the odd little other thing thrown in as well. They had to be on a regular DHI testing program. There had to be an intensive housing system for the lactating cows, no grazing, otherwise we can't measure what they're exposed to in the summertime. And all lactating cows had to be on the same bedding system. For sample and data collection, each herd was visited and sampled twice, once in winter, once in summer. And on each sampling event, uh, we collected paired samples. There was a used bedding sample collected from the back of the stalls or the resting area, whatever that might be, and there were 15 randomly, quasi-randomly selected stalls. And then the new bedding was collected out of the bedding storage area, wherever that was. So new and used bedding. Other data collected, we had the herd uh, manager or owner fill out a questionnaire describing the facilities, the dairy, bedding management practices, parlor routines, that kind of thing. We also had them report on the number of clinical mastitis events for the last 30 days. And um, recognizing that clinical mastitis data isn't necessarily the most reliable data, but we thought we'd ask for it anyway. And then finally, and this is the, the data that we really trust more, we've got the DHI test day data for the test that both preceded and followed the date that the bedding sample was collected. So this will be herd level utter health data that we're looking at, not cow level. The bedding samples were frozen, shipped off to the University of Minnesota where we went through the routine culture. Um, our unit is CFUs per milliliter. Um, we're not going to talk about why ours is different. We can later if you like. Anyway, um, reported total bacteria counts, coliforms, klebs, uh, environmental streps and staph. We got bacillus and a couple other things as well, but I'm not going to talk about that today. And then the, the samples underwent chemical analysis for deep dry matter, organic matter, and pH. So both the new and the used bedding samples were tested as such. Okay, so some preliminary results. I'll just give you some descriptive results first, and then we'll go into measuring or evaluating whether or not some of these associations exist. So we enrolled 181 herds from 17 states, West Coast, Midwest was the best represented, Northeast, and a little bit from down in the Southeast. Um, unfortunately, only 168 ended up having usable DHI data, so that's what we're moving forward with, with a lot of this analysis. For the bedding types that were represented, so we ended up with 362 total samples collected in both summer and winter. Of those, we had really good representation of the four groups of bedding materials that we were targeting. 26% were sand, new sand, 17 were reclaimed sand, 22 were manure solids, and 34 were other organic. In terms of facility types, it was skewed heavily towards freestall herds. 86% were freestall herds. 8% um, were tie stalls, 3% 3, 3 were dry lot, and 3% were a composted bedded pack arrangement. Again, this is a convenient sample, observational studies, we weren't prescribing. It would have been nice to have a better representation of other um, housing types, but this is what we got, and that's fine. Okay, here's some uh, DHI herd characteristics. Um, come from the DHI data. So herd size, the mean was 940 cows, the median was roughly 450 cows, quite a range in herd size. Milk yield roughly at 11,600 kilos. Average linear score on the test that followed the bedding sample collection event uh, was 2.4. The proportion of cows with an elevated linear score, I'm going to call them infected, although we realize that's an indirect estimator, 22%. Uh, the new IMIs, so those are cows that were low, had a low linear score on the last test and a high elevated linear score on the next test, 8.6%. And then the chronics, so those are cows that were elevated both at the last test and again at the next test, 12%. Um, and there's a fair bit of variation there. And then finally, the reported, this is reported by producer, the clinical mastitis incidence in the previous 30 days um, was reported to be 3.5%, which is believable. Um, again, a lot of variation there. Uh, crudely, these are just crude descriptive statistics describing the bedding characteristics. So first, this is dry matter. So we've got manure solids, new sand, other organic, and reclaimed sand. The blue is in the new bedding sample, the red is in the used bedding sample. So you can see manure solids, okay, 60% dry matter. Um, 
new sand and reclaimed sand predictably above 90% in terms of dry matter. Here's the organic matter in the four bedding types, predictably new sand and reclaimed sand and very, very low organic matters, they should. Uh, and here's the pH. I'm not sure if this is exciting or not. Um, there they are. A little bit of a difference between new and used in the other organic, but otherwise, it's, I don't know. It is what it is. So, so there's some descriptive stats. Okay, moving on to some of the analysis of the questions. Um, is there an association between this and that? So what we want to work our way through is, are bedding bacteria counts associated with utter health? If they are, then can we back up and define or dis identify bedding management practices or characteristics that are associated with bedding vector counts or directly associated with utter health? So we're going to start with this question right here. Are bidding bacteria counts associated with utter health? The explanatory variables, the risk factors we're looking at, and each one of these is looked at separately, are the total bacteria counts, coliforms, club, environmental streps, or staph species. What are the counts in the bedding? And then the utter health outcome variables we're looking at are those herd level things. So average linear score, proportion infected, new IMIs, chronics, and the 30-day clinical mastitis incidence. Um, for each of these, for the moment, we've looked at them using mixed linear regression. We're discussing whether or not we should use other approaches to uh, analysis, but this is what I'll show you today. We offered to control for season, region, herd size, breed, and milk yield. We have repeated measures by herd. We're analyzing these relationships separately for the new and the used bedding samples. Um, and, and typically, we start by analyzing with all the bedding materials lumped together in the, in the same big model, and then later we split them out by each, into each of the four bedding groups because, as you'll discover, there are some differences by bedding type. So, looking at all of the bedding materials combined, um, we did find a positive association between total bacteria counts in the bedding, in new bedding, that's what I'm going to describe here, and utter health. So here's an example. Here's the total bacteria count in the bedding and the average linear score. This is just the predicted regression line. As one goes up, oops, the other one goes up as well. Here's um, the proportion of cows infected. Same, well, it's curvilinear, but a positive relationship. The new IMI rate, the same positive relationship. So all of this makes sense. Um, as bacteria counts go up, your utter health gets worse. Um, this is the same thing, uh, but now we're looking at total coliform counts in the bedding, in new bedding versus utter health. So here's the coliform count in the bedding and average linear score, coliform count in the bedding and proportion of herd infected, same deal. Straps looked identical to the coliforms. So yeah, we can say all bedding materials lumped together, there seems to be an association between bacteria counts and worse utter health in the herd. However, when we start looking for differences within bedding types, there are differences. So we have to stratify the analysis and look at in each bedding material on its own. So that's what I'm going to show you next. Um, and we actually, we, we've got manure solids, we've got new sand, reclaimed sand, and then the other organic. And even within the other organic, we've split out straw and shavings because they are different enough from one another that it, they deserve a separate look. Um, so I'm just going to show you some of those, not all of them. But here's used new sand. So it's new sand that was collected, used out of the stall. We had 92 samples. Okay, and I'll, I'll orient you to this table of results. So in this table, what I have is on the vertical column, left-hand column, is the explanatory variable, um, which is the bacteria count in the bedding. So total bacteria count, the coliform count, CLEBS, streps, or staph levels in the bedding. And then across the top, I've got the dependent variable, average linear score, new IMIs, chronics, clinicals, and so forth. And then in each cell, that is going to contain the result of the regression model that asks the question, is there a relationship? So if you see nothing, if it's a blank cell, it means we found no relationship between the bacteria count that we were looking at, the type of bacteria, and that particular utter health um, outcome variable. So nothing in the cell means no relationship found. If you see a little plus sign in a red box, that means we found a positive relationship. Um, the red meaning, oh, and that's bad, okay? So we found in used new sand, as the strep, sorry, as the staph counts in the bedding went up, 
so did the proportion of cows infected, the new IMI rate, and the reported clinical rate. They were also higher. So that's why it says positive relationship and red means, oh, and that's bad, right? So there was something in using new sand associated with staph, but not much else. Um, and I just cherry picked a graph because you always need to cherry pick your prettiest graph to show people. This is an example. Here's the staff count in the bedding plotted against the proportion of cows infected. The blue dots are the raw data. The black line with the red dots is just the predicted regression line. And so, for example, with this relationship, it was predicted that for every one log increase in the staff count in the new used used new sand, we got roughly a 1% increase in the proportion of cows infected. Uh, here's used reclaimed sand, 55 samples, mixed bag, all right, mixed results. So as the staff counts went up, so did the average linear scores. As Klebsiella counts went up, so did the chronics, so that was bad. Um, however, counterintuitively, as Klebsiella counts went up, average linear score went down. Um, as coliform counts went up, new MI rate went down. You know, that's not intuitive. And again, this is the beauty of observational study. Sometimes we see things that just don't make sense and we don't understand why, but it is what it is. Um, there's cherry picking a graph. Here's the staff count in the used reclaimed sand plotted against the average linear score for the herd. And we've got scatter plots for anything that we found positive or negative relationships with. I'm going to skip straw and shavings. They also had some, some mixed. We found some relationships that were intuitive, others were not. Um, manure solids. So this is interesting in that it's new manure solids. That that's where we found most of the associations, not the used manure solids that were taken out of the stall, but the new manure solids. And here's that table. Interesting, eh? So um, lots of red. Lots of positive relationships. There's a positive relationship, one, two, there's three different utter health outcomes that are fairly consistently uh, associated with elevated levels of bac total bacteria count, coliforms, clubs, streps, or staph in the new manure, manure solids. So I don't know if this is all the red indicates, oh, so this is why manure solids are so bad? I don't know, or so risky. Here's one that's counterintuitive, the clinicals, but for the most part, that's a pretty consistent uniform message. Um, and there's a scatter plot, just as an example, total bacteria count in the new manure solids plotted against the proportion of herd infected. So just to sum up that analysis, at least so far, looking at bedding bacteria counts and whether or not it's associated with other health outcomes, Yes, as a general rule, high bedding bacteria counts were associated with worse utter health, but the relationships did vary by bedding type. Um, in manure solids, it was the new manure solids that had the most consistent associations with utter health, and it was coliforms, clubs, strep, staph, total bacteria, anything, pick one, they were all associated with worse utter health. For the other bedding materials, there were fewer associations and the results tended to be more mixed. Um, and they tended to be in the used bedding that was collected out of the stall, not so much the new bedding before it went into the stall. So new sand, uh, the risk was elevated staff counts. Reclaimed sand, there was some staff or club CL associations. Shavings, I didn't show you shavings and straw, but we saw some associations with coliforms, club and staff species in shavings, and with strep counts, staff counts, and club CL counts in straw, all being associated with worse utter health in one or more of the utter health parameters that we looked at. So, interesting. Not, you know, uniform, not consistent across the board, but we did see some interesting results, um, some of which jive with some older studies. So that's fine. So we've described that. Now, the next question is, what are the bedding management practices that are determinants, or at least associated with bedding bacteria counts, and or directly associated with other health? So we want to do this analysis next, and then this analysis. And I'm going to do them together. And then the bedding management practices we're going to look at over the whole study, we want to look at the bedding material itself. We want to look at the bedding characteristics, organic matter, dry matter, pH, and then eventually, we haven't done this yet, get to the management. The question of how frequently do you put the bedding in the stalls? How frequently do you scrape alleyways, uh, facility design, and so forth? Uh, we haven't got it all done. T today I'm going to talk about bedding materials and the dry matter and organic matter analysis. 
So we'll start with bedding material. So really the question is, is there an association between the bedding material and bedding bacteria counts? And so here are the four bedding materials, manure solids, new sand, other organic and reclaimed sand. And here's the, this is just the uh, total bacteria count, the log of the total bacteria count in the new samples before they go in the stalls. So you can see, sorry, new sand and other organic have the lowest total bacteria counts, manure solids and recycled sand was surprisingly high, um, also in the new. In the used, everybody's high. There are some statistical differences here. I question whether or not an utter can discern the difference between a you know, 6.4 million and a 6.5 million, whatever. Um, and everybody's high. So use bacteria counts do go up after being put in the stall. We knew that. So this is total bacteria counts by bedding type. Uh, this is coliform counts by bedding type. So here's new bedding materials. Their coliform counts, again, highest in manure solids, lowest in new sand. Uh, here's coliform counts in used bedding materials, still highest in manure solids, although everybody creeps up. Uh, strep counts. Same deal, highest in manure solids and re reclaimed sand, lowest in new sand and other organic. In the used bedding, everybody's high, okay? So with this analysis, we can comfortably say, yes, the bedding material matters. Um, at least in the new bedding, there are significant differences in the bedding bacteria counts between bedding type. In the used bedding, eh, not so much. There's some statistical differences. I don't know if those are biologically important, those differences. Now, the next question is, um, looking at this relationship here, is the bedding type directly associated with the utter health? So we looked at bedding type and bacteria counts. Now let's look at bedding type versus utter health. Um, and here we're seeing some strong messages that manure solids are bad. So what we have here is the bedding type, the four bedding types, and average linear score in that group of herds. Manure solids being the worst, no difference among the other three types, which is interesting because in some other studies, um, uh, new sand is, is significantly better than some of these others, but in this study, they're all the same. Um, same thing, here's the new IMI rate, again, highest in herds using manure solids, no difference among the other three bedding types. So I guess that's evidence that the bedding material, yes, it is associated with utter health, at least in this study. Worst in manure solids. Okay, so just to sum up the relationship between the bedding type and bacteria counts and other health, um, in new bedding, bedding bacteria counts are highest in manure solids and reclaimed sand. In used bedding, they're basically high in everything. Everybody gets elevated. Um, and utter health was worse in manure solids herds as compared to the other three bedding types that we're looking at. So that's uh, bedding management when we're looking at bedding material being the bedding management. What bedding did you select? Now we're going to zoom in on the bedding characteristics, ask the same questions, but now we're going to look at dry matter or organic matter as the risk factor and, and see if it also is associated with either bacteria counts or utter health. So associations between bedding characteristics and total bacteria counts in new bedding. So here is the dry matter percent or the organic matter percent modeled against the total bacteria count in new sand or total bacteria counts in reclaimed sand, other organic or manure solids. So this is, I think, interesting. I, I like it because it makes sense intuitively. As dry matters go up, there's a negative association with, in total bacteria counts in these three bedding types. So as dry matters go up, bacteria counts in new sand, reclaimed sand, or other organic materials go down. I like that, makes sense, I can, I can relate to that. Uh, organic matter, similar thing, in three of the four bedding types, as organic matter goes up, the bacteria counts also go up. So that's in red because we presume that to be bad. So this makes sense. Drier bedding is good because we see lower bacteria counts in at least three of the four bedding types. And organic matter is bad because as we see higher levels of organic matter, we actually see higher levels of bacteria counts in the bedding. So I like that because it's intuitive. So that's this association. Now the next thing we're going to look at is, is the dry matter or organic matter associated directly with utter health, that association. So we'll start with dry matter, and we'll start by lumping all the bedding materials together. Um, 
So generally, as, as we went through this analysis, we found pretty consistent findings. As the dry matter went up, as the bedding material got drier, then we saw an improvement, like lower average linear score, lower new infection rate, and so forth. So that made sense. This is lumping everybody together. Regardless of bedding material, the drier it was, the better the other health. What about organic matter? So this is lumping all of the bedding materials together. Huh. So as organic matter goes up, we see this weird curvy linear thing with the average linear score. Same thing with the new IMI rate. This doesn't make sense um, until you remember we're lumping all the bedding materials together. So reclaimed sand and new sand is living down here with very low organic matters. Other organic is up here and manure solids lives in the middle. So this is this doing the data analysis this way, lumping them together, is almost certainly confounded by the bedding type. So we need to stratify by bedding type and do this separately. So that's what I'm showing you next. So used sand. Uh, so here's the dry matter in use, the used new sand, uh, organic matter in the used new sand, and we're not really seeing much with utter health. Um, in fact, there's two relationships here that are negative, which are counterintuitive. Don't know what to make of that. Again, observational studies, maybe there's other stuff going on that we're re not recognizing, um, but that doesn't make sense. What about the used reclaimed sand? So here things are making a little more sense. As the dry matter goes up in the used reclaimed sand, um, the proportion of cows infected went down. Now we didn't see anything with the other outcomes, but at least that went the right direction, okay? Um, organic matter in the used reclaimed sand, as that went up, the average linear score, proportion infected, and chronics all went up. So that makes sense too. So this, this actually does make sense. Um, so better, higher dry matter is good, higher organic matter is bad in used reclaimed sand. There's the scatter plot of organic matter against average linear score. I'm going to skip shavings and straw again and just show you the new manure solids. It's a mixed bag. Um, most of the time, it kind of makes some sense. It doesn't always make sense. So as the new manure solids get drier, as drier matters go up, we see a decrease in average linear score, proportion infected, and chronics. That makes sense. But we saw an increase in the new IMI rate. That makes no sense. As the organic matter goes up, we also see a decrease in average linear score and chronics but a positive association with uh, proportion infected. So some of this makes sense, some of it does not. Um, but in general, uh, you know, three out of four, ain't, that ain't bad, right? Um, as dry matters go up, for example, there's the proportion infected going down. So let's just to pull it all together, sum it up. Um, summary of relationships between bedding bacteria, sorry, bedding characteristics, bacteria counts and other health. Looking at this here, um, as it relates to the reduced uh, total bacteria counts, if that's our outcome, we, typically we want higher dry matters and lower organic matters. Okay, good. Um, if we look at this relationship here, bedding um, management versus other health, used new sand, eh, not sure we figured anything out there. Used reclaimed sand, we've got some evidence that we want low organic matters, high dry matters. And for the used shavings, used straw, or new manure solids, we've got some evidence that we do want high dry matters. And all of you are saying, I already knew that. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, okay, but we got a whole lot of data now to support that. So that makes sense. So anyway, for what it's worth. So to summarize the preliminary results today, increased bacteria counts are associated with utter health, but the relationships do vary by bedding type. Number two, um, looking at specific bedding materials, um, the bedding material chosen or selected can be associated with bacteria counts and other health, with manure solids being the worst choice. And then looking at bedding characteristics, organic matter and dry matter are going to be important for some bedding materials. High dry matter is going to be important for almost all the bedding materials we're talking about. Low organic matter is going to be important for reclaimed sand. Okay, next steps, um, we want, if we can, if we finish the analysis I just talked about, we're comfortable with it, the next step will be 
uh, to, if we can, develop benchmarks or goals for interpreting those bedding culture reports, knowing what we know. Um, maybe we'll be comfortable enough to develop goals or benchmarks for dry matter, organic matter, maybe even pH. Uh, we'll see. And then finally, look at that questionnaire and see if we can tease out what bedding management practices um, they're doing in the herds that are associated with lower bedding counts or better utter health. You know, whether it's use of conditioners or frequency of bedding application, other things, barn design, what have you, we'll, we need to get into that still. Study strengths, it's the biggest study done to date of this kind. We've got multiple bedding types represented, multiple regions, multiple seasons, so that's, I think, pretty cool. Um, however, limitations, this is an observational study, so it has the potential to be confounded by things that we don't know about, that we can't control for, can't analyze, so we may see some associations or we may miss some associations with this type of study um, that aren't real. These are herd level measures of utter health using the DHI data, so we have no ability to look at individual cow or quarter, uh, you know, the etiology of an infection, that kind of thing, we can't do that. And then finally, when we start to get into the bedding management strategies, when we get into that analysis, very quickly we're going to run out of power. We're going to run out of sample size for some of the questions we want to ask. For example, an obvious question will be, for manure solids herds, does the processing technique matter to the dry matter or the bacteria counts or whatever? So of the herds that we had using manure solids, 19 were using raw, 12 were using composted, great, but only two were using digested, three sun-dried, and three mechanically dried. So we'll have an ability to describe what these people were doing and getting for their results, but we may run out of power looking at you know, a statistical analysis for, for differences. We shall see. So, did Jenny, was she right? Keep it clean, keep it dry. Yeah, Jenny was probably right. Um, but hopefully with this work and uh, the work of other researchers going on here in Canada, in the US, in the UK, there are other people working on these types of questions. Hopefully we're slowly working our way down the road, learning a little bit more about you know all of this stuff, how clean, how dry, how do we monitor, and so forth. That I need to acknowledge, uh, first of all, funding. Uh, BI stepped up in a big way to help us get this project started. This is a hard project to get funding for because we're not selling a drug, we're not marketing a vaccine, so it was, it was a struggle to find somebody who wanted to donate, and BI was really generous in doing that. Uh, University of Minnesota, Minnesota DHI, and DMI stepped up later and helped us out, but we could not have got this started without BI, so thanks for that. Also, we could not have done this without a huge level of cooperation from, there were 50 different AABP vets around the country who helped, and individuals from 11 different universities who helped to enroll in sample herds. Again, we could not have done this study without them, our herds obviously. And then the DHI record processing centers, there are four in the US, they all had to help pony up and help get us the data, so everybody cooperated, that was nice. That, I want to thank you for your attention. If there's time for questions, great. If not, I'll be around for the rest of the afternoon. So thank you.